If you're thinking of getting a battery at the moment, either because you have solar energy on your roof or because you're thinking of charging off peak from one of these batteries at night and then discharging during the peak to save yourself some money on electric, the next question you're going to have is out of all the countless systems that are available, which one are you going to pick? Well, today's video we're going to be reviewing the Alpha ESS 3. Now before we get into one of the major issues I actually had with the Alpha ESS battery, let's talk about what system this is so you know exactly what we're going to be reviewing. It's an Alpha ESS Smile 3 battery, it's a 3 kilowatt inverter, they do do larger inverters, and it's an AC coupled system, they also do hybrid systems. This system starts with a 5 kilowatt hour module, which is this one here. You can go add a 10 kilowatt hour module like I've done here, and it can go right up to 30 kilowatt hours. Now you might be wondering if that's the right size for you. Make sure you check out the video top right, which explains why you've got to be careful about when sizing the right battery for you. Now this system was originally installed by Heatable, and when they installed this just 5 kilowatt hour module originally, we had a problem that we noticed on the app, which we'll get back to in the video in a bit later. Then they upgraded it to this 10 kilowatt hour module. Now if you're wanting to follow my journey with Heatable, the system they've installed, the solar system, or you're looking to get a fixed quote from Heatable, go to evnick.com forward slash solar. Now unlike the last unit I've installed, this battery is fully IP rated, which means it can, if you wish, go outside. Now that probably isn't advisable because it hasn't got any cooling or any heating for the battery, which means on a really, really, really cold day, this battery may struggle to actually charge. And also in the summer, if it's baking down on the sun, it's not going to be good for the life of the LFP batteries. However, if it's on a north gable end and you've got a little bit of shelter over it, it should be all right. But you can fit it in the loft, you can fit it in a garage like I have here. Now one thing that's obvious when you see the Alpha ESS battery compared to the other battery module I reviewed last time is the dimensions of the Alpha are completely different. It's a little bit thicker off the wall, it's also a little bit shorter but it's also longer. Now because of these dimension changes you might think that this is a bigger battery. The modules here are 5 here and 5 here. This is just a 5 kilowatt hour module on the other battery. So it has got more stackability when you're getting more batteries against the wall, but its dimensions are completely different. Now this is in keeping with the rest of the market from Alpha. The rest of the market pretty much are this kind of size, this kind of length and this kind of width. So just bear that in mind, if you are looking at putting this down a gill and you're tight on physical space encroaching into it, the Alpha is a little bit thicker than say this Livertech battery here. Now one thing that really impressed me with the Alpha is the actual build quality of the unit compared to some other units I've looked at. Now it doesn't have a screen on it like some other inverters which is a little bit disappointing. I'd like to see some kind of a physical readout of what the battery is doing rather than just the lights on the actual dash. Now the build quality is very good. The only build quality issue I've got is this cover that goes on here is plastic. I would have preferred that to be a metal casing just to make it just a little bit more solid. I know why they've done it, it's to save a little bit on cost, but everything else is really high quality. Now this here, all these glands here are really good quality, all those glands there. There's also some glands down here with, for where the DC isolators are for the battery, and they can be padlocked, closed or open as well. There's like a little keyhole there. There's also an AC isolator here, again, really good nice waterproof cover, and again it can be padlocked, open or shut. It's good for isolation for electricians. But it's also good if you have got this outside where kids could mess with, you could padlock it nice, you know, you could padlock it in the on position so kids can't turn your batteries off or mess around with any of that. Now, the rest of the stuff regarding build quality, again, is also really impressive. The AC and DC electrics are zoned away from each other. You don't cross the wires, you don't mix them up, and the cable lengths to wire the second battery in are a perfect length. In fact, they put the second battery on with absolute Ease. I couldn't believe how quick they did it, how easy it was. So if you are installing multiple of these modules, you're really going to enjoy it. And like mine, if it was a 5 kilowatt hour module before and your customer wanted a 10 kilowatt or a 15 or a 20 kilowatt, they're very, very easy just to snap that next uh, battery on, wire it up and then turn it on. That was as simple as it was. Now on this AC coupled battery, you have two CT entries, and this is where we get to my little problem that we had. Now one of the CTs is for the grid, and one of the CTs is for the solar, and we'll get back to why you need one on the solar in a minute. Now what happens with these CTs is they measure what the grid's doing, measure what the solar's doing, and then 
decide how much to import or export into the battery to make sure that your use on the grid is as close to zero as they can get. Now, my issue was I was still pulling from the grid quite considerable amounts of power and still pulling from the grid and charging the battery instead of the battery going, well, hold on, you're pulling from the grid, let's stop. Now, the end phase app, that also was showing the correct information for what the grid was actually doing and the alpha one was off by random percentages, but it never detected anything really under about 150, 200 watts, anything below there. It was very random with whether the alpha would detect it at all. And that was the same on the solar and also on the grid. So the issue came down to this CAT6 cable and that's because CAT6 cable should not be used for extending CTs. And that's because my system was already pre-installed. My cables are already pre-put in. Now, Heatable wouldn't normally do this for a customer. It's because my system is obviously a test system, a review system, stuff that we're doing constant edits, changes to, ripping out batteries, changing batteries, changing EV chargers, and I needed to be able to keep the cables I already had in. It's under my garden, it's a very long route, and the long route is the reason why we were getting these signal issues with the basically the readings being wrong on the CTs. So we knew we could fix it, we just had to find out how. Now luckily, Heatable went to Alpha and they discussed the problem and we came down to the CAT cable length. Now there was two options, we could either put new cable in for CTs, which we didn't do because it's not going to be digging up my garden. And the other option was to use possibly the uh, cabling uh, loop I've got in there, which was drain pipe. We probably didn't go for that. What we actually went for was fitting a meter next to the actual meter meter. So what this meter is, is similar to what uh, Livetech actually did. It's a meter, which is a, a Modbus meter for the Livetech exists. This one uses like an IP meter. So that meter acts like an old meter, it reads everything with a CT clamp locally right there, and then sends it by the cat cable in like an internet traffic kind of way, a bit like a router to router, modem to modem, basically uses it like an internet signal. So rather than like a CT, which is sending voltage down here to be detected and read by this, this is sending a digital signal direct from the meter to here. So the digital signal, even if there's a, a break or a problem with this cable, it will decode that issue problem and fix it over here at the alpha battery. So this meter, this talks to the meter over there and that meter is a free phase meter, but it works on single phase for me. And that has the option of putting in the grid CT and the solar CT. So if this happens again, Heatable know what the issue is. They're not really gonna be using someone's pre-existing cable, so it shouldn't be an issue, but they know what the issue is and that on long runs, they're probably already specking for this to be have this extra meter in. If you've got a short run or it's very close to your actual uh, grid CTs, you don't need to worry about this meter. So let's quickly go over some things that annoy me about the batch and some things I'm not happy about. First of all, this Wi-Fi module up here really annoys me. Not because it goes down, it works seamlessly. What annoys me about it is it's up here and it looks a bit hideous. Would have been better maybe in here looking a bit, you know, hidden out of the way. And maybe even do a white one so it looks less obvious at the top of there. The other thing that I find quite annoying is this is a three kilowatt inverter. Now, you probably want to do some sizing work out if three kilowatts is enough for you. Uh, give you an idea, three kilowatts is about uh, the power of a kettle boiling on full. The discharge and charge rates on this have been monitored with my system and they're not doing the full three kilowatts. What I actually see is it peaks about 2.9 kilowatts discharge and its charge rate is about 2.7 kilowatts. Now, if you want the full information on this, go to evnick.com forward slash solar or forward slash battery. You can follow my entire stats and reviews that I'll try and publish exactly on there. Now, regarding power in and out, the depth of discharge of many units, especially LFP units, differs hugely. Some manufacturers allow only depth of discharge of 90%. Some allow a depth of discharge of 100%. And this unit here, this has been tested to go down to 96% depth of discharge, meaning that the minimum charge rate you can have on one of these batteries is 4%. Now that actually gives you a battery usable of 4.78 kilowatt hours from these five kilowatt hour modules. Now that makes you decide whether you need a five, 10, 15, 20, 25 or 30 kilowatt hour battery system. Now you can have the option of backup power added to this. Now if you do have backup power, you'll need a separate fuse board and you'll need a lot of earth rods. Like any other 
battery backup system, earth rods, extra different earthing arrangements may be required for most houses in England. But on this system, it's not an automatic switchover on the battery backup system, which means that you will have to have a, a manual EPS switch or an automatic EPS switch fitted separate. It will not automatically switch over your entire house load. That means that really realistic what you should be doing is wiring a separate consumer unit with stuff that you need, maybe just like light, a couple of switches in your kitchen, and just have them as the ones that are powered in the emergency backup. Also bear in mind, because it's a free kilowatt hour inverter, you're not gonna be able to power most of your home anyway, so having a full EPS switch is probably a little bit pointless. And for the amount of real sort of power cuts we get here in the UK where I'm reviewing this, I see it as a very useless option. The app, the website, and the way you can access data on Home Assistant means that the alpha data is really accessible, really easy. The website is really well designed and it has every single bit of information you'd possibly want from your inverter. Now, the reason we mentioned the second CT on solar before is this, like me, you've got an AC coupled system, or even if you've got an old um, solar system which, without a battery, maybe you're on fit and you've fitted a battery to so obviously you can save a little bit more money by not putting it back to the grid, you can see all your solar data and your grid data from the Alpha app. It means you can just use one app, see all the system from one live app, which it's really neat on the website, but the app is also really nice. I really like the way the dark theme works. It's just very, very useful, very easy to use, and you can mess around with some stuff with the work mode. Now, you can also charge and discharge this alpha app from the grid as well as your solar. Now, if you just wanna make it use on self-use mode, just make it use the solar, charge up from the solar, that's fine. But what you can also do is set it to charge from the grid. Now, if you're on Octopus Intelligent at the moment, you're getting paid more to export, so why wouldn't you charge it up? So what I can do here is I can set it to charge every single day during the off-peak energy, but you can also, if you wanted to, tell it to stop charging when it hits 80% charge to leave the grid 20% or your solar 20% room to charge that up later on in the day. Now this is really useful, especially in the winter. If you haven't got really good export rates or you're struggling to fill your battery from the solar, you can have the battery charge up to a set percentage rate every single night and then the, the, the solar energy should top up the difference, but also mean that you've got enough energy to take you through the rest of the day. You can also set when you don't want the battery to discharge. Now again, this can be really useful if you are trying to avoid peak rate electricity. You can tell it not to discharge during the day when you know electricity is cheaper and wait until it's at night during four to seven when the electricity is more expensive or less green and you can have the battery then be fully available at full charge and discharge during those hours. Now one thing you can't do on this battery is force export. So if you're on an inventive tariff like Octopus Flux, you can't tell the battery to force export back to the grid. Now what you've got under this cover is something called AUX ports, auxiliary ports. Now there's options to change what those auxiliary ports are taking the signal for within the website app. Now I don't know fully what they actually do, but I'll give you an idea of what I think they do. And if you know exactly what they do, please leave a comment down below in the description. But from what I understand you could make it do, is you can have it trigger when your EV charger comes on. So say your EV charger turns on, it would then send an electrical pulse down that cable and you could have it trigger an auxiliary in here to say the power's come on my EV charger. And then in the app web settings, you could say auxiliary, if auxiliary turns on, turn battery charging on or turn discharge off. Now this could be really useful if you have an EV charger that's not uh, compatible with turning off, you know, or it's an old dumb charger and you don't want it to discharge the battery into your car, or if you're an Octopus Intelligent and you have a charger that's uh, not telling you the times, you don't want to keep manually changing the times every day when the battery charges and discharges, because the way Octopus Intelligent works, it could mean that your battery starts charging during 6 p.m. and you've got this battery then discharging into your car. So the way I understand the auxiliary is you can have it do certain tasks depending on what those uh, triggers are. Let me know in the comments down below if you know for sure that's what they do. Now, earlier on the video, I mentioned Home Assistant, and that's because I have the Alpha ESS API working in my Home Assistant to get all my data. One thing that does annoy me about Alpha is they don't publish that data locally 
on the network, which means I have to go to the cloud to retrieve that data, which means if the Alpha cloud goes down, I won't have that data historically. It'd be nice for Alpha to push that data locally and allow local access control of what the battery does on and off regarding the settings. Now, if you are interested in getting a quote from Heatable for Solar, then go to evnick.com forward slash solar to follow my solar journey. And also check out this list of playlists here with all my solar, battery and inverter reviews that I've done so far.